Thank you for joining us. I'm Marnie Hughes. This is Missing on News Nation. Before we get to our featured cases this week, we have several new and urgent missing alerts that we are following and want to pass along to you. First, a major update in the search for Madalena Kojakari. Madalena was last seen getting off of a school bus in North Carolina just before Thanksgiving 2022. Now News Nation has learned that her mother, Diana Kojakari, named a suspect in her disappearance, has reportedly fled the United States. And a now deleted Facebook post from Diana showed her on an airplane from New York saying that she was heading to Frankfurt, then Romania. Diana writes that she is returning after nine years away, leading many to believe her final destination is her home country of Moldova. Cornelius police named Diana a suspect in the investigation and disappearance of Madalena just a month ago. She also pled guilty to felony charges of failing to report her daughter missing, but was released because she already served the maximum time for the crime. And it was during our exclusive reporting on this case this summer that we shared the eerie comments Madalena's stepfather, Christopher Palmiter, made in court. Where do you think Madalena is? I think Diana took her somewhere with maybe her Moldovan family. I don't know. Um, but I believe that Diana has tucked her away somewhere where she's not going to be found. Saying she's not going to be found. The jury deliberating only 15 minutes before finding Palmiter guilty of the same charges, failing to report a missing child. His sentence suspended. He will serve 30 months of probation now. Despite the conviction, still no answers about what happened to Madalena that day. Desperate for answers and frustrated with the investigation, the family of Taylor Casey is no closer to knowing what happened to her. Casey was vacationing in the Bahamas there on a yoga retreat when she vanished June 19th. Today is her 42nd birthday. Her mom telling us she has concerns about this ongoing search and how her daughter's disappearance is being handled. My idea is really saddened, saddens me when I think about it. I feel like my child had two strikes against her when she went over there to that yoga retreat. And one was that she's black, and the other is that she's transgender. Taylor's phone was found in about 50 feet of water, but police have not been able to retrieve any data from it so far. We have several possible breaks in the case of a missing cowboy from Wyoming. Chance Engelbert vanished five years ago while he was visiting his in-laws in Garing, Nebraska. We thought this surveillance image of Chance walking along a road was the last time he was seen the night he was vanished, but new tips now lead investigators to believe Chance may have made a stop at a convenience store about two miles away. I spoke with the private investigator Ryan Daniel about these latest developments, along with some possible witnesses he desperately wants to speak to. I want to start with this convenience store and a possible sighting of Chance just a few miles away from where he was seen on that surveillance video. Tell me more about uh, what happened that night and the authenticity of that lead. Well, this lead that came from the convenience store clerk actually surfaced the first week um, after Chance went missing. Um, don't know why it may have got overlooked, but um, by going back through a lot of evidence and a lot of witness interviews, um, it kept coming up about the convenience store clerk that allegedly saw a chance. Um, we were focused on the WTT because that's the area that his phone last pinged, but come to find out, uh, this clerk was not working at the WT. He was actually working at a convenience store about two blocks north of the WTT. So that was a new lead for us. So how does that change the investigation? And what do we know about the encounter at the convenience store and Chance's state of mind? Well, according to the clerk, uh, Chance was actually in a good state of mind. He didn't appear to be heavily intoxicated. He was... A, it did confirm to us that he was actually out walking during the storm uh, due to his shirt being wet. Additionally, um, it is believed that Chance was having a tense but not heated conversation in the back of the store while looking at uh, drinks to buy. 
um, the convenience clerk was a the convenience clerk was able to identify the actual drink and can of tobacco that Chance purchased with cash prior to leaving. And it does help us with our timeline. Uh, according to the clerk, we believe it was between 8.30 and 9 p.m. that night. And where do we think he went after that? Do we know? The clerk believes that he started heading back south. Um, evidence that we have gathered during this investigation indicates that we do have an area of incident, possibly where Chance went missing, down there by Stable Club and Five Rocks Road, um, also at the junction of Owl Road. So if he did leave the store at 8.30, between 8.30 and 9, that would put him down there in that area, which we believe not only the area of incident, but the area of time, which we believe uh, Chance's disappearance is focused on between 9 and 9.15 p.m. that night. There's another lead here, Ryan, uh, and that is a couple people who may have been around Chance that night, may have encountered him that have nothing to do with his disappearance, but who may have seen something. Tell me about uh, what you have found and the people potentially that you're looking to talk to. So we did have some, we had a witness that contacted the tip line. Uh, the witness indicated that between Somewhere around 9 to 9.15, maybe 9.10 p.m. that night, uh, two females in their mid-20s, uh, both wearing jean shorts and a black top and a, and a white top, uh, were seen running down from the railroad tracks that cross over Five Rocks Road, or also known as Avenue I. Um, these two females appeared to be frantic, uh, in, a, in a state of panic, and they were actually attempting to stop traffic on Five Rocks Road. They continued to run down Five Rocks Road and headed north towards where the um, auto dealership used to be, the used auto dealership. Once there, they were picked up by a small white two-door truck pulling a metal boat on a white trailer. Uh, according to an, an additional witness that was there, so now we have two witnesses, This, these two females appeared to know who the driver of the truck was and they got inside. This is important to us because we believe that this being the area of incident and the time that Chance went missing between the 9 and 9.15 time, we have questions. You know, what did you see that night? What spooked you? What made you nervous? Why were you trying to stop traffic? We think possibly they may have seen Chance. They may have seen somebody out that night. We, that time frame and where Chance was when he went missing, we need to narrow down. Yeah, and it could be critical to understanding where he went that night. You know, I think what is so mysterious and peculiar about his case, he was young, he was healthy, and he seemingly just vanished. I know you have to pursue a lot of different theories. Is one of them foul play? And are you leaning towards that in your investigation? Of course, in my line of work, we never rule anything out. Um, it's unfortunate, but uh, foul play is still on the table, yes. Where do you go from here, Ryan? And how can the public help now five years later since that July 4th weekend when Chance disappeared? So with the public's help, I would really like to identify who the two females were running down the hill and that were trying to stop traffic. Additionally, whoever the driver of the two-door truck, the white two-door truck, pulling the boat, I'd really like to speak with them. Um, what did they see that night? What was out there that night? What direction did they go? They may have seen Chance and not known they had seen Chance. They may have seen somebody injured and not realized it was Chance. So, so far, a lot of information that we've put out there, we've been able to, to identify people and speak to witnesses. But uh, whoever was out on July 19th, between 9 and 9.15 p.m. in the storm, at the area of the railroad tracks and Five Rocks Road. We just ask that they come forward so we can speak to them and find out what happened that night. Finally, Ryan, is there still a reward and how much are police continuing to look in this investigation? I know they're always strapped for resources, which is why folks like you are so critical. So the reward actually, uh, the $200,000 reward expired on December 2nd, 2023. It was actually Chance's birthday, 30th birthday. Um, there is still a $20,000 reward for information that would would lead to uh, finding Chance or finding out what happened to Chance. Uh, as far as law enforcement, you know, I, I can't really speak for them. I can tell you I did request a meeting with them to go over some evidence to present to them. 
Uh, they did meet with me. Um, they did take a copy of my report. And I think they were very thankful. Um, I can tell you this, uh, there are some members of the Garing Police Department that I think Chance has been on their mind and what happened to Chance. All right, Brian, we'll stay in touch with you. I hope that some of this new evidence uh, leads to some answers for Chance's family. I often think about Dawn, his mom, uh, as we have spoken to her over the years. I know it's a painful nightmare that they continue to live. Uh, let's hope this is the break that, that that family needs. Appreciate your time, sir. Thank you. And if you have any information that can help in the ongoing search for Chance Engelbert, you can contact the police department in Garing, Nebraska. Now to this week's featured missing case, and it is a mystery in Marietta, Georgia, it's a suburb of Atlanta, and where Tiffany Witten was last seen. Tiffany's family is also, just like Chance's, desperate for answers into what happened to this young mother on a September morning in 2013. Her family telling us the one person who may hold the answers is due to get out of prison this fall. Miss you, Tiffany. We thank you all the time. Love you. A balloon launch in 2014 marking the one year anniversary of when Tiffany Witten vanished. It's been nearly another 10 years since that launch, and Tiffany has still not been found. The last known sighting of her is on this Walmart security footage, where she was caught high on drugs, shoplifting about $20 worth of items with her boyfriend, Ashley Caudill, at 2 in the morning on September 13th, 2013. I know that she had put a couple of inexpensive items, I think, in her purse which was weird because they had money with them. They actually paid for some items. They waited for them to go through the checkout before they actually grabbed her. She passed the, the point of sale and got close to the door. The loss prevention people stepped out. They kind of grabbed her purse and then she ran out of her flip-flops and, and takes off into the night. Tiffany's boyfriend, Ashley, said that after Tiffany ran off, he began to look for her. According to some people, Carl called some people to get them to, to come there to the Walmart and the IHOP, and uh, they said he asked them to do sort of a cursory look, look for her. Ashley also went to a nearby IHOP where Tiffany had worked, asking people if they'd seen her. Somebody said, why don't you just call her? And he said, well, I can't because I have her phone. I know at one point I was told by Marietta police that she had accepted a couple of friend requests mm -hmm. after that date. And how could she have done that? She had no phone and no computer and no place to live. So I don't know how she would have responded to friend requests after that date. So I feel like whoever had her phone did that. Those accepted friend requests and other parts of the story investigators have learned about that night have left them with many questions still unanswered. No doubt, uh, Ashley Caudill is the, the primary person uh, of interest. He was agitated and angry about this whole situation at the Walmart. That was clearly evident from the, the Walmart video. The working theory is that whatever answers are out there, Ashley Caudill holds them and um, he has not been forthcoming with us about things. He had said over and over that he would take a lie detector test, but when he was given the opportunity to do that, he refused. The communication that I've had with him was mainly saying to him, look, I just want to know where she is. I just want that peace to know that she's at peace and you can give me that, but so far he has not. Caudill has been in prison for the last decade for peddling meth. He's due to be released in September. Meanwhile, Tiffany's family says the last 11 years has been a daily fight for answers. They say in the beginning, it felt difficult to get the attention of investigators because Tiffany was an adult with an addiction to heroin and meth. Everybody kind of wrote her off because she was an addict. An addiction is a disease that you fight every day. And she had the biggest heart. She would give you the shirt off her back. Like She was a great person and people tend to not see that. And mm -hmm. so that was kind of the hard part for me. I feel like she wasn't taken that seriously. Tiffany's family says some of the hardest parts of her being gone now are the milestones that have been missed, like her daughter Addie's high school graduation this year. It's just hard to like 
<laughs> like know that she wasn't there, like to think about that she wasn't there to see it. She would have been really proud. Yeah, and that's what I think about. That she would have been proud. It sucks that she couldn't have been there. Because Addie was just six when her mom vanished, she's lost those imprints of our loved ones we treasure in our minds. I wish I just had memories because I just, I don't, I don't have any memories really. My intelligent mind tells me she's not still alive. Um, in my heart, I want to believe that she is. It's a huge conflict for me and I just need to know because I feel like I've lived the last 11 years just in limbo. In the long run, all that matters to me is knowing either she's here on earth and she's happy and healthy or she's in heaven. And I just need to know one of those two things. A mother and a family trying to piece together these mysterious dots. Joining me now is Tiffany's mom, Lisa Daniels. Lisa, uh, I know that you were in excruciating pain. It's difficult to look back at the journey of this investigation. How are you holding up? Well, you know, it's one day at a time. Uh, I know it sounds cliche, but it is. There's not a, a day that goes by that she's not at the forefront of my mind and just wanting to know what happened, where she is. And it's um, it's difficult. It's very difficult to, tell, um, to tell, live that every day. Tell us a little bit about Tiffany, your fondest memories of your daughter, what you want to share with people uh, to let, let us all know a little bit more about her. Well, I think my fondest memory of her is just her sense of humor, which her daughter definitely inherited. She she has a great sense of humor. Um, she's very sweet. She had just a special gift with um, special needs kids and elderly people that she just, that was something that she really loved. And it was something that I had always hoped would lead her to some sort of, you know, counseling or um, some sort of assisting um, special needs people or elderly people because she just had such a gift and just such a zest for life. Um, obviously she made a lot of mistakes, but I tell you, it's, um, she had just a ton of potential. So it's, it, that makes it even more difficult um, to know what she could have been. Well, it sounds like she had a really big heart. And I think one thing about our Missing series, Lisa, is it doesn't matter the mistakes people made. They are somebody who is cared about and you will not stop in your search to find her. And it's not our mistakes that define us, but she had some challenges. Tell me about those challenges and, and how that gives you some clues into the, into the efforts to try to locate her. Yeah, she definitely did have some challenges. Um, so you know, mental health issues, which I believe is really what led her into a, a life of addiction. And I, I do honestly feel like she wanted to leave that life. She wanted to turn things around. But what I've learned um, since all this started is just how difficult it is um, when, when you become addicted to these drugs, especially heroin, uh, methamphetamine. It is just a very difficult journey from there to try to turn your life around. The percentages of people who are able to turn it around are um, pretty low to my understanding. So, um, you know, it's heartbreaking, not just for her. There's a, a lot of people that um, that live in that world and it is, it's just heartbreaking because I know a lot of those people, I know all of those people um, have people in their lives who love them and, and want to see them turn it around. And I believe that she really did want to, but once those drugs take hold, that's a difficult, that's a difficult thing to do. Yeah, it takes a, a dangerous grip on a on a person's life. What did what did being a, a mom mean to your daughter, Lisa? Oh my gosh, <laughs> she she loves, just loves Addie, and um, just I can remember her first birthday. She had a special dress made for her and a special cake made for her and you know it, it was always such a big deal and and i know addie doesn't have a lot of memories of her because she was so young but um and that's sad to me because she addie truly loved her and i think that was one reason why she did want to get herself clean and turn herself around because she wanted to be her mommy and um 
you know, I, it just breaks my heart that that didn't happen for her and that it didn't happen for Addie because I know how, how much Addie needs, needs that connection. And it's not the same, you know, being raised by your grandparents, it's not the same. Well, she is still very blessed. I can see how big of a heart you have and, and that, that heart same in your daughter. You know, one of the challenges, Lisa, that I know you all have faced in your search for your daughter that is common in a lot of the missing cases that we cover is the struggle to get the attention on the case that you believe it deserves, the investigation, right, um, to continue to pursue it, especially after all of these years. I want to share with folks who are watching um, a, a clip of an interview we did with Joni Moeller. She is a former investigator who worked on Tiffany's case. Uh, here's that for our audience at home. It's a case that that is close to my heart because I did get to see, you know, the, the devastation that it causes the scene that, that most people don't see. Um, you know, they see what happens on the news and they see, you know, what happens with the victim, but they also, they don't always see the impact that it has on the, the rest of the family. And clearly on law enforcement as well. Lisa, what does it mean to you to hear those words from Joni, who was part of the investigation as you all continue together to search for answers? Yeah, Joni is, boy, she has a special place in my heart because she was really the first person who believed me that there's something wrong here. You know, she's she hasn't disappeared because she wants to be um, gone. There's definitely something wrong. And a lot of other people had written her off and Johnny didn't do that. And she put her heart and soul, like she said, into this investigation and um, you know, we continue to, to work together to try to educate law enforcement about missing people. And regardless of background, just like you said, somebody out there loves that person. And um, so we do try to speak to law enforcement um, whenever possible. We speak to criminal justice classes at Kennesaw State University. Um, we've spoken to some um, even seasoned law enforcement, um, people at the police academy um, in a class that she started, um, a missing persons class. And so we do try to, to educate because it's, they have their training, obviously. Yeah. Nobody can tell them that that's wrong, but um, you know, you, you have to keep your mind open and you have to know that when a family member is standing in front of you and saying, look, you know, here's the reasons why I believe that there's that something has happened to my loved one. You've got to open your ears and you've got to open your mind and you've got to listen. And Johnny did that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm forever grateful to her. Yeah, she heard you. It, it means so much. Do you have a theory about what you believe happened, Lisa? We heard you a moment ago say that you're holding out hope that Tiffany is somewhere out there, um, but there's a reality to all of this. How do you walk that delicate balance of of what you know and and trying to understand what you still don't well i i don't let my mind go to the place that um you know a lot of people have said well maybe she was sex trafficked or maybe this maybe that i i just will not let my mind go there um uh, i i do know that if she is still on this earth um that she's not in a place where she can reach out to the people who love her because she would. Um, she would never be gone for this long. She would never leave her family. I mean, when you talk about the milestones that she's missed, I mean, not only that, the death of her grandmother, who she just adored, um, she missed. And she's missed her sister's wedding, her daughter's graduation, the birth of her first niece. Um, you know, just so many things. And I know that she would not, uh, she just wouldn't stay away. So, like I said, my, my intelligent mind says that she's no longer on this earth. And I would prefer to believe that than to believe that she's being held somewhere against her will. I, I would rather believe that she's not on this earth than to think that. Lisa, my heart goes out to you and your family. Uh, thank you for giving us a little bit of your time and thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing uh, part of who Tiffany is to you and what you miss most about her with us and our audience. Uh, praying for you and, and we'll stay in touch, okay? 
Thanks, Maury. We really appreciate you covering her case, too. Thanks so much. God that. bless you. All right. I want to bring in Jesse Evans now, an investigator on this case. It is an ongoing investigation. Now, Jesse, thank you uh, for joining us. You're a former Cobb County prosecutor. Tell me what stands out to you a decade now into Tiffany's disappearance and how you take a next successful step in understanding what happened to her. I think it's just the lack of answers. My heart breaks every time I see my friend Lisa talking about the um, mysterious loss of her daughter. And, um, you know, there are people out there that know information about this case. And I think the biggest takeaway that maybe your viewers can take from this is that we're listening. There are people um, such as myself, Johnny Muller, who have um, dedicated significant years of time investigating this case. And, and I know answers are out there. It's just a matter of people being willing to come forward and give some of those. Let's talk about the boyfriend for a moment. I mentioned he'll be getting out of prison here in the next few months. Ashley Caudill, what more can you share about questions you have and others have for him once he's released from prison? Yeah, you know, I strongly believe that Ashley Caudill's probably the key to solving the disappearance of Tiffany Witten based on uh, the years of investigation I've spent working on the case. Um, this is not a very savory character. He's got a long criminal history. He's spent the past uh, decade in prison for uh, drug trafficking and uh, just, just a very bad character, not somebody that you would want to have dating a relative of yours. Um, and with that comes some baggage as well. So, you know, he was living in a kind of dark underworld and sometimes it's hard to get people associated with folks like Ashley Cottle to uh, cooperate and give the information that we know and believe is out there. What is the most compelling evidence so far in this case, Je Jesse, whether it's digital, whether it's the surveillance video that we're seeing now from the Walmart? Um, what's the best clue that you have to go on? I think the biggest clue is what you're seeing right now. It's that surveillance video from, from the Walmart. Um, as with any uh, cold case, any missing persons case, you want to kind of start with a known and then do consecutive circles out from there. Uh, our last known, for lack of a better term, is this Walmart video where we can visibly see that uh, Tiffany is alive and well. Uh, looks like she might be struggling from some uh, addictive habits and things like that. Um, but otherwise, this is sort of the, the, the glimpse of time that we need to start with and then move outwardly to figure out what happened before that, what happened afterward, so who is she uh, with, who was Ashley with, and, and what sort of insight can we glean from the timeline that begins, in my mind, with September 13th, uh, 2013 and the shoplifting event. And does it become more difficult to glean leads the more time that passes? Absolutely. I'm a seasoned homicide and cold case investigator. i dedicated my entire career to, to those topics. And time is not the ally of law enforcement. Um, uh, you know, we start all of our investigations thinking, hey, this case will be solved tomorrow or next week or whatever. And when cases go cold, missing persons cases go cold, um, time is not the friend of law enforcement. Now it's almost like you're relying on chance discoveries of something to advance your investigation. And uh, that's not something that we feel very confident about. We are constantly trying to generate leads and not uh, just be reactionary and hope that leads fall on our lap. Yeah, the last thing a family like Tiffany's wants is for the case to go cold. What is your message, not just to her family, but others of missing cases that we cover to continue to try and prioritize the case in law enforcement's mind when we know police have a lot on their plate and resources are strapped? I think there's two lessons that we can take, maybe three. Um, the first lesson is uh, take these cases seriously from a law enforcement perspective. Um, it's easy to look at a case like this at the beginning and, and uh, say, oh, well, she's got a drug history and she's not been living a very uh, healthy, healthy life and uh, or she'll turn up. And um, that's sort of a mistake. And it's a mistake that um, uh, many in law enforcement have fallen upon. I think the, the second lesson is be careful of um, domestic history and who your domestic partner is. Uh, Ashley Cottle is not somebody you want to be in a relationship with based on the history that I'm aware of. And third and finally, the, the point that I would leave with you is know that there are family members out there. Um, and, you know, Tiffany Witten is just not a name and a 
pretty picture. She had a mom, she had a, a sister, she had a daughter, and um, there are people that are continue to grieve today. These cases are sometimes even more sad than your typical homicide case, because at least with a normal uh, homicide case, if there is such a thing, uh, ideally you've identified an offender, you've made an arrest, and at least there'll be answers and accountability. Here you have a situation that's even more devastating because there's so many unknowns. Yeah, and there's pain in that unknown. Finally, Jesse, do you believe Tiffany's case is solvable? Absolutely. I've always believed that this case is solvable. There is evidence that's out there. I think that the right people need to share the right information, and they've been unwilling to do so to date. And uh, I believe this case can be solved, and uh, it's just going to take people uh, keeping this case in their attention, in their forefront, and knowing that we are listening. Yeah. Well, we thank you for the work that you're doing. Jesse Evans, thank you. I agree. The more people that see this and share it, uh, we together can find the answers this family so deserves. I appreciate your time, sir, and your work on this. If you have any information on how we can help Tiffany and her family uh, find justice in this case, you can contact the Marietta Police Department. That, again, is in Georgia. This is where you come in to help solve these cases. Make sure as well to join us next week as we look into the disappearance of Troy Robert Galloway, Once a proud Marine and a doting father, he struggled with mental health, but his family says he would never abandon his young children. Take a look. I even told him, you know, I I said, you're really blessed. You have these kids and you have a good wife and all that. And he said, I know, Mom, I know. We have a closer look into Troy's disappearance next week right here on News Nation. And if there is a missing person case you think we should know about, send it to us at newsnationnow.com slash missing. You can also send us tips through our News Nation app. I'm Marnie Hughes in Chicago. This is Missing. Thank you, as always, for joining us. I'll see you back here next week. <laughs>